want to thank everybody for being here. Today, you know, I'm heartbroken when I see um, where the future's heading. To me, World War III has begun. They say that America is in a proxy war with Russia. Hey, Scott, give me a gun. I want to go blow this guy's brains out. If you give me a gun, are you an accessory to the crime? We have a judge who will tell you whether that's the case. Short answer is yes. <laughs> yep. Short answer is yes. You know, so, you... so America is, is we're, we're at war with Russia, flat out. And now, just before going on the air, I read, I think about another, what, 400, 300 million dollars of more military weapons. And we're holding this rally, and we're honored today to have the people that care among the most about what's going on and where we're headed for and what we have to do to stop it. We have Scott Ritter, uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, Gary Null, Phil Giraldi. And we put on this, this um, peace and freedom rally and people said, oh, you should call it a festival because you have a rally, you're gonna have problems. You know, screw you, what are you talking about? This is a rally for peace. So last night, I'm at the French restaurant, La Canard, I'm with Eddie. And he was our editor-in-chief of the magazine. We're leaving. Hey, I hear you're having a, a, a rally over there. I said, yeah. I said, but you're not going to like it. Oh, what do you mean? I said, it's about peace and freedom. And to whom did you say this? Some neocon? <laughs> How about a judge? Ooh. A former judge. Mm. And, um... What did he say? I, I said, well, let me show you. Wait just one second. And it's right over here. I said, some fan gave me a book, a folder, with cutouts from the 1970s when the Vietnam War was going on. Mm. I don't have my glasses, Gary. Could you read that? Yes, Why Veterans March Against the War. All right. Look at these pictures, all right? Yeah. Hey, yeah, what's that say? Peace Jobs Justice Rally Sweep the U.S. The Spring Offensive. And Nixon's war. What's this one say? 200,000 rally in capital to end the war. One after another. So I said, you know, they didn't hate you for protesting back then. Yeah, there was a lot of back and forth. But there's not a peep about peace. And he said to me, you mean the Ukraine war? Why don't you tell Putin? I said, why don't you tell Zelensky? I said, they offered a peace agreements to try to do it from the beginning. He said, oh, I'm in, totally in favor of that war. Mm. I said, you are? I said, dress up, put on your military, and go fight, and you take your money. I don't want my money going there. I said, I'm an American. I believe in people by the name of George Washington. No foreign entanglements. And today I'm going to read some of what he said. He says, don't hate a country, don't love a country, don't become involved in a country. And here we are, and you got these clowns that don't have a clue of how this war started, or if you gave them a map of, of, of the world, find Ukraine on it, but this is a judge with an attitude. So, of course, you know, mm. and then one of the guys said, you know, uh, we're at a table over here, and we're in Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, be a coward. Mm. Be a coward. No one's speaking out against peace. Or, or for or peace, for excuse peace. me. Yeah, well, well, look. These are dangerous and dark times in which we live. The five of us know that. I'm going to explain how Joe Biden on his own, Donald Trump could have done it, George W. did it, in utter defiance of the Constitution, can commit American material to, uh, to fight a war. Congress never declared war. Congress authorized the expenditure uh, of this money. Most of it is, uh, is wasted. Congress didn't authorize the killing uh, machine. But you're basically right. The public is afraid. It believes the lies that the CIA feeds to the media, that the MI6 in Great Britain feeds uh, to the media. Joe Biden and, and Tony Blinken want war. They think that they can overthrow Putin, and that will be uh, their legacy. So what does the CIA do about it? Are they involved in this stuff? This is, Judge, this is a Phil Giraldi, former CIA guy, you know. The whole problem in, with the United States government in terms of how it makes decisions is that there's never any accountability and all the people that basically gave us Vietnam, that gave us Iraq, that gave us Afghanistan, and that now are delivering 
a war with nuclear-armed Russia, which is uh, 10 times more dangerous than any of those previous wars. Right. These people are able to walk away from it because the media does not play the proper role in exposing their lies and exposing the contradictions of the of the arguments that they make justifying this kind of So activity. the media has become so supine because when Gerald was reading these headlines from the 70s, LBJ and Nixon's antagonists were the media. They challenged the government at every turn. Today, the media is in favor of this war. Why is the media in favor of us fighting in Ukraine? Well, I mean, I think back in the uh, 60s, you know, when we had people like Walter Cronkite uh, at CBS, the, the, these big, and, and it, it was big business. No, I mean, we know CBS is a business, ABC is a business, NBC is a business, but these businesses made a decision that they were going to have legitimate news rooms and that they were going to report the news. Report the news. Report the news. That's the emphasis. That they didn't make things up. They weren't there to shape a narrative. Their job was to report the news regardless. So you could report the news regarding a Democratic president, you could report the news regarding a Republican president. I mean, the, the, the big culprit here is cable news. Uh, CNN started it, Fox came on. Uh, suddenly the news stopped being a lengthy cycle that you know had a lot of people pushing to get news on at one period of time so Robert, Walter Cronkite could speak to the American public. It became a 24-hour news cycle, which means now there's no quality control. Uh, there's, there's nothing. The other thing that happened is uh, the newsrooms had to start making money, that these businesses weren't willing to pay the price to have a quality newsroom that lost money, to, so they created a cachet, a good name for themselves that increased the value of the overall corporation. News became business. Business is linked to advertising yeah. dollars, yeah. which means now my job as a newscaster is not to inform anybody, it's to entertain you. And the way I entertain you in a 24-hour news, news cycle is to have continuous access to headline-making sources, which is the government. So there's a direct nexus between the government, which is seeking to shape perception, and the news media, which today now is dependent upon the government, which wants to shape perception, to get the headlines necessary to entertain people, so, to generate advertising. I dollars. worked at CNBC for a year and at Fox for 24 years. I was in front of a camera 14,500 times in my 24 years at Fox. I cannot dispute what you're saying. Because the American public wants news people to perform and they want to be, they want to have their preconceived notions supported. They want a version of the news that pleases them. Yeah. NBC, or the CNBC and CNN know what their viewers want. My That's former thinking. Fox colleagues know what their viewers want. And what suffers? Truth. Yeah. Yeah. Truth. And Gary Null, of course, has Progressive Radio Network. And he has... Progressive with an uppercase P or lower? Lower. <laughs> <laughs> In my world, progressive means just seek the truth without being ide an ideology. I look at it a little differently. I believe everything you've all said bear witness to the truth. But being in a different profession, I look not at the symptom, I rather I look at the cause. And I cannot detach everything that's happening from Ukraine on and all the warnings Putin gave and how our whole goal when Gorbachev signed that treaty was to stop NATO from going any further and everything that he asked for was pushed aside and NATO went forward. To me, that is not the major problem. The major problem is the American people. Why? How likely is it, if you have not chosen, chosen to make a healthy choice in what you read, what you listen to, whether you listen to Rush Limbaugh on one side or Rachel Maddow on the other, and you're not going to eat the food that's actually going to nourish you, nourish your heart, nourish your lungs, your eyes, your brain, then what is the likelihood that you're going to dig deep enough into all this of a mess to find the truth that you have a responsibility not to remain a silent majority, but rather to be absolutely vocal in what you will and will not tolerate? That's a freedom of choice. And that's a freedom of choice we're not using today because we have 200 million silent Americans. You never see them. They don't come to demonstrations. They won't be here today. And yet they all have an opinion but the opinion is not translated into political action, social action, or personal action. 
So if I see someone who is not caring for themselves, how their children are taught in school, that they're not challenged in curriculum, let alone how it's taught, what they're taught, then what is the likelihood they're going to want to know? What is the truth of Russia and Ukraine? What is the truth of a January 6th that doesn't have cross-examination? What is the truth when you don't have both sides with an equal capacity to seek the truth? And we have corruption at every level of our society today. You can't name an industry that's not corrupt from the top down. I'm saying what's the bottom of everything? The American people. When I arrived here, you were finishing one of your weekend rants, which are worth, <laughs> their, which are worth their weight in gold. And you were talking about how debilitated the kids are today because they've been raised by the people that you're talking about. Yes. Now, you were really talking about the kids that are the murderers, the ones who... Yeah, they're out of their mind. ...are out of their minds. 90% of all have mass a... murderers have been on psychiatric medications. 20 to 21 American soldiers every day have committed suicide, yeah. mainly by putting a gun in their mouth and blowing their brains out. Ask the medical authorities how many of those people are on psychiatric meds that you should never take, Paxil, Prozac, Effexor. Are active duty uh, uh, soldiers on, on meds, on psych sure. psychotropic, psychotropic meds? meds? Yeah. Sure. Ask all of now those who were in Afghanistan. Them. Well, I mean, here's the problem with the military medicine, is that the government's very good at um, getting you addicted to something. Yes. And then, yeah. they, then the government decides that you're cured and they stop giving you that which you've become addicted right. to. And now- And you're a mess. You're a total mess. So now you have to break the law to acquire things and you're not getting, for instance, um, the same quality stuff. And so even if you're breaking the law to get something that you now need because the government made you need it, and this happens with painkillers, psychotropics, the whole thing you're getting substandard drugs, which may be giving you something complete different result than what was intended. And the end result is you are a broken individual um, and you're prone to depression and you find yourself in a horrible space one night at home, uh, alone, isolated, afraid, you pick up the pistol wow. and you blow your brains out. You have out. no support system. No. I found Zero. in Titusville, Florida, <laughs> Zero. small area Zero. Over, near Camp, uh, over near Cape Canaveral, I was told I had to go with my camera person to see for myself. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. I walked through the woods for about an acre and there was a campment of homeless vets. How many were in Florida at that time? 16,000, 16,000 men and women. Where was the army? Where was the secretary of defense? Where was the media saying, don't these people count? Where was the American people? Look, you go, I'm not gonna pick on somebody here, but I, I, I'm on total agreement with you here. I can walk around Kingston right now, and I will tell you, we will find cars that have the yellow ribbon on the back. I support the troops. The hell you do! Because if you supported the troops, you'd be there in that field helping those 16,000 troops. You'd be at a VA hospital helping a guy that's drooling into a cup. You'd find the veteran who's been kicked out of the hospital, who has no legs because he got him blown off in Iraq, who's upstairs, can't get downstairs, his eyes like, you'd be helping him. If you support the troops, you support them 100%. And that doesn't mean when they're standing tall, looking good in uniform, ready to go off and serve their country, you say, oh my God, I love you. You look so good in uniform. You're hot. Now they're coming home broken. Do you love them still? Because that's when they need your help. They don't need you when they're looking good. They need you when they're broken, when the system has dumped them. That's when they need you. And the American people suck because we say we support troops and we don't. We say- well, Ron, let's stop sorry. right there, wait a minute, let me go. I apologize. And you, no, no, <laughs> no, because you're 100% right. We're gonna go fight with Ukraine. Yeah, right. We're gonna go fight with Ukraine. They're not gonna go fight. No. And if we got in the war, they'd be supporting it. And it's just exactly what you're saying. And then when these guys, you know, when they're, when they're blowing their brains out and they've lost their lives, they lost their legs, they have no lives left, Nobody gives a damn Isn't about there it. some sort of uh, a pension or financial compensation for uh, veterans that are injured? It depends. I mean, are, are, you, are, 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 you, an, are you an active duty right. regular guy or are you a National Guard guy or are you a reservist? Okay. Because, because it injured, changes. If, if, you're, just a, if you're just a veteran, in battle, if, if you're just a veteran you, have, you have virtually no rights. No rights and it's the worst medical system in the United States. Joe Biden addressed American troops two weeks ago in Poland and said, be prepared to go to Ukraine. And then he went like this, and some of you have already been there. That's what Phil Giraldi wrote about that. Yes. 
right? Do American troops want to fight for Vladimir Zelensky? Well, right. American troops are already fighting for Vladimir yeah. Zelensky. Uh, the, the question is, we were discussing, you and I were discussing, how uh, vulnerable they are because they're not in uniform. They so have, they can be summarily they have, executed. They have no protections under the, uh, under various codes that protect uniform soldiers, and these people can be shot as spies. Uh, these people can be tortured. I, I fully expect that we will have American casualties and deaths in the near future, and that uh, not only that, the Russians uh, could easily capture some of these people, and these people will, in many cases, talk. And once they talk, you know, suddenly the, the lie that underlies the whole business going on in Ukraine begins to, to unravel. And that maybe is a good moment. I, I think that this is one of those wars that, there's no such thing as a good war, but this is a war that's indefensible on any level and could have been avoided. Mary Rothbard said the last just war that Americans fought was the revolution. Right. Yeah. Because we seceded from a tyrant. <laughs> and now the tyrants are back. Yes. They tell us what to do. And again, it's about freedom and peace. You know, one of the things that, you know, down the streets over here, you see they have the farmer's market. And a couple of weeks ago, there were all these women and, and men going back, you know, bring back Roe, bring back Roe. Okay, fine. You want to bring back Roe versus Wade, and you're saying, my body, my choice, fine. How about my body, my choice, I don't want to get a vaccination. Oh, you have no right no, to say that. No, they don't have that. You have no right to say that at all. It's not your body, your choice. Correct. And by the way, Planned Parenthood, from the data from CNBC, that's the only one I could find, they gave over $2 million to promote the vaccine. Wouldn't surprise So the hypocrisy of it. So let's go around now why we're here today. So I'm here to try to talk to people about peace, and I'm going to do it with a different tact. I'm going to talk about why we can be friends with Russia. All right. That's what I'm going to talk about right. today, is why we can be friends with Russia, why we don't have to hate Russia, why we don't have to kill Russians. This is a peace rally. That's right. Uh, you know, and I am literally the anti-peace. And what I mean by that is my whole upbringing was to close with and destroy the enemy through firepower maneuver. Okay, I don't do peace. I never did it as a, as a growing up. War is my thing. It's my gig. I hate war with a passion. I despise war. So that's why I'm here. It's what happens after war. Someday this war is going to end. And at that point in time, we collectively are going to have to deal with the ramifications of that conflict. And one of the greatest ramifications is the absolute deterioration of relations between the United States and Russia. If you think for a second that this world will survive in a state of perpetual conflict between two, the two largest nuclear armed nations in the world, you're wrong. The only way we survive, the current generation, the only way our children survive, the only way our grandchildren survive is for there to be a way to bring our two nations together in peace and harmony. Hey, Ritter, uh, whatever you've been drinking or smoking, I want some of that because that's pie in the sky stuff, man. You can't deal with Russia. You can't deal with Vladimir Putin. There's no way we're going to be able to get along. I'm here to tell you that that's just a bald-faced lie. And an amazing thing happened when I showed up in the, in the former Soviet Union. I was in a place called Vodkinsk. They had a factory that produced ballistic missiles, including intercontinental ballistic missiles, the ones that were targeted at American cities. You have a wonderful inspection monitoring system. It didn't happen overnight, though. And it didn't happen because the Americans produced it themselves. It happened because we were working in harmony with our Soviet counterparts to do something that was deemed to be mutually beneficial. It works, ladies and gentlemen. Imagine that. I was trained to hate the Russians. And the reason why I say hate is, you can't go to war against the people unless you hate them, because you can't kill people you like. You can't kill people you love. You can only kill people you hate. And that's the God's honest truth. All right, you have to hate somebody to kill them. And I learned how to hate the Russians. Now I have to work with them. I got invited to the home of one of my Russian counterparts. This is a man who built the missiles that were aimed at American cities. And he was inviting me, a Marine, who was trained to kill him and his, and, his, and his fellow countrymen, into his home to meet his wife, his kids. We had the most wonderful night. 
And I learned at that point in time, it was like having a veil lifted off my eyes. The Russians are just like us. Russian people are just like the American people. He loved his wife. He loved his children. It was stunning. I learned some very important words, like drug, friend, druzhba, friendship, mir, peace. These are three very important words, and they suddenly had relevance. And I began to think, how the hell did this happen? That I, a guy who was ready to kill these people, suddenly look on them as friends. And then I watched the way the Russians raised their children. And what I realized is that there's a universal truth. You're a human being first. Take a look at children when they come into this world. Do they know how to hate? Somehow between there's a transition from this innocence of childhood to what I had become as an adult. How did this happen? I was programmed to think that way. I was taught to hate. And the hatred came from a place of ignorance. One of the best things that ever happened to me was the two years I spent in the Soviet Union working together, cooperating with my colleagues, with my friends, I guess I can say that, my friends, my Soviet friends, to build something that had never been built before. The United States and Soviet Union were on the cusp of nuclear annihilation. Sound familiar? Sort of, sort of what, where we are today. Two nations that didn't trust each other. Two nations that had developed and deployed weapon systems that put them on a hair trigger alert. One mistake and the world ends instantly. We were cognizant of that back then. How many Americans are cognizant of that threat today? How many Americans understand that all it takes is one accident, one mistake, one miscalculation, and all this wonderful life that we enjoy ends forever, forever. We've forgotten that we did overcome all of these obstacles of hate, of ignorance, and we came together and we actually functioned in harmony with the Russian people. We viewed them as our equals. We viewed them as, again, the friend, drug, friend, druzhba, friendship. Where's it gone? How did we lose this? How did we let this slip away? I don't know, that's a question for historians. But what I can say, what we need to focus on is how do we move forward? Imagine hearing a Marine, a soldier, a sailor, an airman being given a very significant award for developing friendship with the Soviet people, for being a good representative of his nation, for furthering relations between the American people and the Soviet people. Could you imagine the military giving a member of our armed services today a medal for that? No. Why? Because you've been conditioned to hate the Russians, to think ill of the Russians, to believe that we have to confront the Russians. We don't. Old fat people like myself like to get on TV and radio and talk about how tough we are. People with combat experience, you don't see them out there talking that nonsense because they know some hard truths. Terminal exhaustion. It means taking sand and rubbing it in your eyes so you can't close them. It means being thirsty, but you can't drink because there's no fresh water. Whatever water you might have is probably contaminated with blood or the guts of your comrade that got shot. You will never get rest because you have to be up 24 seven preparing for the next round of action. It means every single day losing your humanity because you are compelled to kill in a cause you don't understand. That's war. We as a nation need to reprogram ourselves so our government can once again find a path to peace with Russia because that's the only path for the salvation of our nation and the world. And what brings you here, Judge? To well, you brought me here because we are the best of friends and because we believe that nobody talks about peace. But I'm going to talk about the law, the Constitution, its utter demise and utter uh, destruction in the past 75 years that would allow a president to fight any war with impunity. 
and how that undermines civil liberties at home, why war is the health of the state. We wrote a constitution. We added the Bill of Rights to the Constitution, which guarantees that our rights come from our humanity and not from the government. All these rights come from our humanity. But when the government wants to assault these rights, what does it do? It wages war. James Madison wrote the, the uh, Constitution. He wrote the Bill of Rights. He chose language so that future generations would know that our rights come from our humanity. The First Amendment doesn't grant you the freedom of speech. It prevents the government from interfering with the freedom of speech. <clears throat> Where does the freedom of speech come from? From your heart and from your head. The Justice Department has a rule that because treason is the only federal crime for which you can be executed even if you didn't personally cause a death. Only the President of the United States can authorize the treason prosecution. What left-wing pinko big government monster was the President of the United States that authorized this prosecution? Little Jimmy Madison, the same guy that wrote the Declaration of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I think the worst president in American history, bar none, was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is the first head of state in the history of the world to target civilians and to target civilians from his own country. Abraham Lincoln caused the death of 750,000 Americans, and it didn't occur to him until three years into the war, maybe I should free the slaves and claim I'm doing it as a military measure as the commander in chief. During the war between the states, it was not a civil war. It was not a fight for control of Washington. The, the southern states wanted to secede, just as we had seceded from Great Britain. Secession is as American as apple pie and is even alluded to in the Constitution and the Declaration. Among your natural rights is the right to travel. It's the right to leave. It's the right to leave as a group if you want. It's the right to avoid the government. It's the right to say you're not the government anymore because everything you have you have stolen and everything you say is a lie and the best thing you do is to kill. When newspaper publishers in the North were saying that about Abe Lincoln, instead of responding to their criticism, he had them locked up. 3,000 journalists in the North, not in the South, were arrested and confined in military prisons for the duration of the war. The only claim he had to that power was because we were at war. And when we're at war, the chief of state claims that everything he does is to win the war, civil liberties be damned. After Lincoln was killed, a unanimous Supreme Court invalidated every one of those arrests. It's a little too late, but it's a great legal opinion arguing, holding, that the Constitution subsides and subsists in wartime as well as in peace, in bad times as well as in good. And all those rights that we have cannot be taken away just because the government and its killing machine are looking for monsters to slay. John Adams, who was the second president of the United States, not my favorite because of the Alien and Sedition Acts, nevertheless re-argued, you're gonna hear from Gerald in a few minutes, the brilliant words from George Washington about the need for neutrality, the need to stay out of foreign conflicts. John Adams, John Adams caused the phrase, coined the phrase, we shall not go about the world looking for monsters to slay, because if we do, there will be no end to what we are looking for. And when we do go about the world looking for monsters to slay, as every government, as every president since FDR has done, without a single declaration of war, every single one of them, including the sainted Ronald Reagan, has looked for monsters to slay in foreign lands, 
because it lets them exercise more power, it lets them raise taxes, it lets them say, support the troops. How many times have you heard somebody say, I don't support the war, but I support the troops? What the hell does that mean? I don't support the war and I don't support the troops. I want them home. I want them out of harm's way. War is about your body having had everything just wrenched out of it so you're exhausted. War is about having eyes that are red, feels like sandpapers in your eyes. War is about smoking cigarettes so you can get that nicotine poison in you to keep you awake or chewing the tobacco just enough to keep you awake till you maybe can slip that upper that they give you, the amphetamine, to keep you up for another 36 hours. So war is about being jittery. Words about that smell so freaking bad that you got Vicks in your nose because otherwise you'll be puking. But you can't puke because you're starving, because you're hungry, because you haven't eaten. War is about the worst thing in the world because now war is about watching the guy that you've trained with. You know his wife, you know his kids. He's got gut shot and his guts are spewing out and he's screaming for help and there's not a damn thing you can do about it because you got to go up over and close with an enemy who's just like you and you got to kill him or he's going to kill you. That's war. And the beautiful thing about war is it don't end ever. It's not like you can go to a movie, watch all this crap, and when it ends, you walk out. War's about the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day. War's about destroying humanity, destroying the soul of the individual. We say we support the troops. No, if we supported troops, we would never support war. Because war is about taking the best kids in America, putting them in uniform, knowing that if we ever use them, we are destroying them. That's what war is about. I want their uniforms off them and their weapons surrendered and having them with their wives and husbands and enjoying society and life, not looking for Russians to pick fights with, as Major Ritter just told us about. Who the hell would die for Vladimir Zelensky, Joe Biden? FDR, of course, confiscated gold, manipulated the Japanese into bombing Pearl Harbor. We all know that today. Because he believed that only a war would get us out of the, uh, would get us out of the depression. One of the most horrific things FDR did, and he didn't personally do it, he ordered the military to do it, was the Japanese Exclusion Acts whereby 125,000 Japanese Americans, human beings born in the United States of America, were incarcerated without charge or trial in American concentration camps in Utah. There were also 10,000 Italian Americans born in the United States, incarcerated in a concentration camp outside of New Brunswick, New Jersey, if you know the geography between Princeton and New Brunswick. And the Supreme Court of the United States, by a vote of five to four, upheld that monstrous violation of human liberty because we were at war. So you see my point, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. Government grows during war. I can't describe the killings and the misery that, they, that the warriors go through, as my friend Major Ritter did. But if you think about what he described, it'll cause you a sleepless night. Remember what George Patton once said, when you put your hand in a wad of goo that a moment before was your best friend's face, you'll know how horrible and horrific War is. Hell. The critical point is we are playing with fire in a situation that could not only destroy this country, but which could destroy the entire planet. And until people seem, come to the point where they realize that this is all based on a tissue of lies coming out of the U.S. government and other governments, and also coming out of the media, there are ways for them to start to figure, wait a minute, I'm being fed a, a total load of BS here, and I am not going to stand for it anymore. I can't wait. <laughs> I think it's going to be a great, uh, yeah. a great gathering. There is considerable irony in the fact that Biden is giving Ukraine $1.7 billion for health care, while health care in the U.S. is generally considered among the poorest 
in the developed world. Neither Syria nor Iraq nor Iran in any way threatened the United States, just as the Russians did not threaten Americans prior to a regime change intervention in Ukraine starting in 2014, when the U.S. arranged the overthrow of a government that was friendly to Moscow. The U.S. has also begun to energize NATO to confront the alleged Chinese threat. The toll coming from the constant warfare and fear-monging has also enabled a steady erosion of the liberties that Americans once enjoyed, including free speech and freedom to associate. I would like to discuss what the ordinary concerned citizen can do to cut through all the lies surrounding what is currently taking place. It is an information plus propaganda war that sustains the actual fighting on the ground, and it is sometimes, in some senses, far more dangerous as it seeks to involve more countries in the carnage, while also creating a global threat perception that will be used to justify further military interventions. If it is a newspaper or magazine article, skim all the way down the text until you reach a point towards the end where the sourcing of the information is generally hidden. If it is attributed to a named individual who indeed indisputably had direct access to the information, it would at least suggest that the reporting contains a kernel of truth. But that is almost never the case, and one normally sees the source described as an anonymous source or a government official, or even in many cases, there is no source attribution at all. This generally means that the information conveyed in the reporting is completely unreliable and should be considered the product of a fabricator or a government media propaganda mill. Even when a story is written by a journalist who claims to be on the scene, it is also important to check out whether he or she is actually on the site or working from a pool operating safely in Poland to produce the reporting. Yahoo News lately takes the prize in spreading propaganda as it currently reproduces press releases originating with the Ukrainian government and posts them as if they are unbiased reporting on what is taking place. Another trick uh, used frequently uh, to make fake news look authentic is to route it through a third country. When I was in Turkey, we in the CIA never placed the story in the media there directly. Instead, a journalist on our payroll in France would do the story, and the Turkish media would pick it up, believing that because it appeared in Paris, it must be true, though it was not. In fact, it was totally fabricated. Currently, I have noted that a lot of apparent MI6 produced fake reports of Ukraine have been appearing in the British media most notably The Telegraph and The Guardian. They are replayed in the U.S. media and elsewhere to validate stories that are essentially false. Television and radio media is even worse than print media, as it almost never identifies the sources for the stories that it carries. So my advice is to be skeptical of what you read or hear regarding wars and rumors of wars. The War Party is bipartisan in the United States, and it is just itching to seize the opportunity to get a, a new venture going. And they are ob oblivious to the fact that they might be in the process of about to destroy the world as we know it. We, we must expose their lies and unite to fight to make sure that they can't get away with it. I'm first going to talk about freedom of choice and what that means. But more importantly, we love war. We love violence. Where's Gandhi? Where's Martin Luther King? We have never sent real emissaries who are spiritual in nature to understand what it is to be the other and find the sacredness in another human being that you wouldn't want to kill them. You wouldn't want to see them maimed. You wouldn't want to see their towns destroyed because that resolves in nothing of a conflict except it exacerbates it. They weren't ideologues. They weren't political. They were simply looking for a way to resolve issues, and how you resolve an issue where there's conflict is find what is important in the other person that you also can identify and what is sacred in the other person you can also associate with. Because when you so show that another person is a human being, irrespective of what they've done wrong, you try then to mediate what caused the conflict and what is necessary for the solution. We don't have peacekeepers. We don't have 
those who go forward trying to find what is special, what is unique, and what is, what is spiritual in the other. In fact, we only hurt those once we demonize them. So if you want to hurt someone, first demonize them. And who demonizes more than anyone else? All of the media. From NPR to PBS, they're all, in my opinion, promoters of the worst of human nature. We should have freedom of choice, but the wrong choice, which is almost always what we do. Look at all the bankruptcies. Look at all the people buying something they cannot afford. Let us look to see whether or not we have made the right choice, and who's put the choice in our mind? Edward Bernay was the father of, of all propaganda, and virtually everything you see today is propaganda. Stop trusting the experts. Because the same people in the New York Times and Rachel Maddow and all the other program and CNN, they all told you weapons of mass destruction. They were wrong. Vietnam would be the domino leading uh, the Viet Cong to America. Wrong. That Syria was run by a tyrant gassing his own people. Wrong. Honduras needed to have a coup. Wrong. Everything they've done has been wrong on foreign policy. Everything they do on domestic policy is wrong. As a result, we have no infrastructure that works. Our railroads, our bridges, our dams, our dikes. When you have two and a half million children who are homeless in the United States, when you have 16 million adults and children who are food insecure, when you have 55 million Americans living under the poverty level, when you have half of all Americans can't give you 500 bucks because they don't have it, they're kiting their credit cards, paying one credit card when it gets to the end with another. We are bankrupt because the government's bankrupt, because the states are bankrupt. If it wasn't for the bailout, every single major state would go under. New York City would go under. New York State would go under. Their constitutions don't allow them. So when it gets too bad, they just print more money. And that's your inflation. That wasn't Vladimir Putin who created our inflation. That was spending a fiat currency that isn't worth a damn. So when it comes time to make any choice, any choice about going to war, do your homework. But don't use Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, Twitter, and the media as a guide because they can't ever tell the truth about anything. And don't just believe everything on the internet because they've infiltrated the entire internet with misinformation. Do your homework. Do your research. Walk away from the grid. Walk away from buying the New York Times, watching television, supporting PBS or NPR. Walk away. My clothes made in the USA, union labor. All right? Walk away from clothes in, from Bangladesh. Walk away from non-organic uh, non foods. The farmer's market over here today had organic, non-GMO. Support them. Support what is natural and non-toxic that leads to health and happiness. Look for the positive news. Look for the examples of people who are doing the right work at the right time in the right place and be a part of the right support system. No longer should we be priding ourselves in being a nation. Well, we don't really act, we're not activists. We don't get involved with the silent majority. Well, I'm sorry, but the silent majority should also be aware that when you're silent, when atrocities against your own people, let alone other people, are occurring, you're a coward. Stand up, even if you're going to be knocked down. All of us are going to get our asses kicked, and we're going to get on the ground a lot of times. But the courage of getting back up again and say, you might have beat me, but you've taken nothing away from me that's essential to who I am. Have the courage to speak up. Have the courage to fight back. Thank you all. And Gary tells me that I get excited. I got to well, you do. <laughs> After 19 cups of coffee, you get a little excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's time. Time. Come on. How the fuck are you two to get here at the same time? When I count it off, give me some fuck, okay? One, two, three, four, four.
heart is broken, passion and life is joy and beauty. And these low life little pieces of crap, your little politicians, politics, suck out. the joy out of life. Hey, I'm the governor. I'm Andy Cuomo. I'm born on third base. I thought he had a home run. My daddy was Mario. I'd be a nobody if daddy wasn't there. And I'm going to tell you what to do. Lock down your businesses. Stay in your houses. I'm going to make up any crap I want and shove it down your throat. You're not an American. I'm the governor. I'm the mayor. I'm the president. I'm the chancellor. You're all people that have robbed us of our freedom, our liberty, and our joy of life. And this has to stop. Amen. Do not stop. We are on the four corners of freedom. Crown and John Street. The seeds of democracy were sown here. And now we got a bunch of little arrogant clowns robbing us of our freedom and our peace. And it has to stop. We, we have to bring back the true spirit of America. And now, as I say, when all else fails, they take you to war. And they've taken us to World War III. It's begun. As the roads are all rotted around the country, as the bridges are falling down, the White House said on Friday, announced another $270 million worth of US, you ready for this? Security assistance. Isn't that a nice word for all the little stupid people to swallow? to enrich the military-industrial complex, to keep a war that would have ended if they negotiated for peace in the beginning. And again, totally against the invasion, and again, totally understand why it happened. I'm against it, but they should have negotiated for peace. Then they go on to say, the newest batch of supplies will include four HIMRS rocket artillery launchers. The aid package, wait a minute, you're talking about sending weapons of death, you're calling it an aid package? Who are you talking to? I'm talking to the American people, and they'll believe anything we say because they listen to the mainstream news and listen to those little prostitutes, those media whores that get paid to put out by their government whoremasters and their corporate pimps. So we'll say anything that we want. President Joe Biden, quote, has been clear that we're going to continue to support the government of Ukraine and its people for as long as it takes. World War III has begun. They're only going to make it official when a nuclear exchange or a false flag happens. Just like Okay, little boys and girls, World War I began when the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. Yeah, what's in Sarajevo and who gives a damn about the Archduke? Oh no, World War II began when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Yeah, nothing else was going on before that. I'm telling you, if we don't unite for peace, we are going to die in war. And by the way, please donate, a lot of you have, to Occupy Peace. We need to make this movement go global. It has to be a global movement. Mankind must put an end to war, or war will put an end to mankind. John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, the guy that got his brains blown out because he didn't want to go into the Vietnam War. I have a photograph of me and John Connolly. John Connolly was the governor of Texas. He was the guy that sat in front of Kennedy that took the bullet in the back. He had read my book, Trend Tracking. And he said, you know, I read your book. He said, your heart's in the right place. He said, well, you don't have a clue what's going on. And neither do the American people. Because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. The latest Gallup survey that just came out 
Just 16% of U.S. adults now say they have a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in newspapers and 11% in television news. Once upon a time, there was a man by the name of George Washington. And he goes on to say, avoid avenues to foreign influence in innumerable ways such as attachments are particularly alarming to the truly enlightened and independent patriots. No foreign entanglements, he said. It's not our business. Europe, this is his farewell address. Europe has, set, has a set of primary interests which to us have none or a very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies. In other words, they're going at it all the time. The cause of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. They're none of our business. George Washington, a real man, Cat crossed the Delaware, right? Yeah, fought the wars. Lloyd Austin, oh, he's a former general. Oh, yeah? And what happened after he became a general? Oh, you mean he's sitting on the board of directors of Raytheon, the second largest defense contractor in the United States? George Washington, a real hero of a man a real fighter, not like these little guys playing president that couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag if they had to, but they're happy to send us. Hey, Lindsey Graham, you keep calling for war all the time, man. Go lead the charge or shut your mouth. <laughs> Harmony, liberal intercourse with all nations, are recommended by policy, humanity, and interests, Washington said. And talking about the military and com industrial complex and people that cared about it and knew about it, another real man who fought or saw deadly, the deadliest war, World War II, Dwight D. Eisenhower, five-star president, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in World War II. His farewell address on January 17th, 1961, quote, our military organization today bears little resemblance to that known by any of my predecessors in peacetime, or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. Imagine that. American makers of plowshares could with time and as required make swords as well, but now we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportion. Added to this, Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security more than the net income of all United States corporations. This conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual is felt in every city, every state, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military 
industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic process. We should take nothing for granted. Only the alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machine of the defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Disarmament with mutual honor and confidence is a continuing imperative. Together we must learn how to compose differences, not with arms, but with intellect and decent purpose. Because this need is so sharp and apparent, I confess that I laid down my official responsibilities in this field with a definite sense of disappointment. As one who has witnessed the horror and the lingering sadness of war, as one who knows that another war could ultimately destroy this civilization, which has been so slowly and painfully built over thousands of years, I wish I could say tonight that a lasting peace is in sight. You and I, my fellow citizens, need to be strong in our faith that all nations under God will reach the goal of peace with justice. Imagine these words, imagine these words from Washington and Eisenhower, and I got these little arrogant freaks spewing out their crap of how we're gonna fight to the end. Again, they knocked down the they, they, they want to knock down the statue of Catherine the Great in Ukraine because of the terrible things that she did to the Ukrainian people. Catherine the Great, when was that? Oh, around 1750? You mean this stuff has been going on since 1750 between Ukraine and Russia? And you want me to get involved in it as an American? That's not my business. You think we'd be in Iraq if the major export was broccoli? You think we'd be in eastern Syria pumping out the oil if they didn't have oil? We have a crime syndicate, as someone told me, that I continue to repeat. This isn't a government. Eisenhower made it clear. Our rights and our freedom have been robbed from us, locking us down, telling us what to do. No, no. Science, only political science. That's all that counts. Zelensky refuses peace talks. The Ukrainian president claims they will not stop until Russia gets smashed. If we don't stop this war, again, World War III has begun. And the arrogance of them sending more of our money to go fight and die, to me, makes absolutely no sense at all. When all else fails, they take you to war. And war has begun. United we stand, divided we die. I bought these buildings, I own the three buildings here. I bought them because the seeds of democracy was so near. And I realized I can't run away. I'm only me because I'm a lucky man. I'm a Napolitano, born in the Bronx. Born to be free. Born to be who I want to be. Having parents, my, they may they rest in peace, my father. I shoot my mouth off, he'd say to me, Papagallo, you little parrot. Stop repeating what everybody else is saying. Think for yourself. How dare you think for yourself? I'm your governor. I'm your mayor. I'm little gruesome Gavin Newsom. A little piece of nothing. But I'm the governor of California. I suck into the system, bow down and take it wherever I have to. Like all the other politicians.
And I know because I was there. I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate at 26 years old. I ran major political campaigns in Westchester County. I designed and instructed American politics and campaign technology, and I taught it at St. John's University. I was killing environmental legislation at the height of the environmental movement in the 1970s, working for the chemical industry. I've been on the other side. Let me tell you who the people in politics are. The people I couldn't stand in high school and college that wanted to be class president or head of the student council. Nobody could believe when I quit. I said, man, this isn't my kind of trip. We'd be in the back of the chamber talking. My buddies would leave me, follow the senator, pull out his chair and help him sit down. Whew, you could blow on these chairs and make them move. I said, what's the matter, man? Cat can't sit down by himself, you need some help? You know, Gerald, you have that kind of an attitude. You're not gonna make it here. <laughs> yeah, I quit, nobody could believe it. Nobody tells me what to do. And I don't tell anybody what to do. And as Americans, nobody tells us what to do. You heard Judge Napoli Napolitano. You heard Scott Ritter. You heard Phil Giraldi. We're Americans. We're free to be us. That's what this country was founded upon. And they're robbing it from us right in front of our eyes. This is just the beginning. We are going to unite for peace, and we're going to bring back prosperity for all. Thank you very much for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And stick around for the hot damn band, because I don't know whether it was Muhammad, Jesus, or Buddha, but one of them said, you better boogie before the lights go out because tomorrow is iffy. There aren't too many people that I would come to see, especially on a day like today, sweating, hot. Well, originally from Connecticut, but I live in Florida, and I came all the way to New York so that I could see Jerry. I watch him every Thursday, never miss a week. I think it was a great turnout. Yeah. A lot of people, just really nice. The music is great, um, the Palatano was great, uh, Gary Noll was great. They were all really good. They're all good people. I'll definitely come back. I always look at things from a whole. Gotcha. You know, everyone cannot learn the same thing. If you're going to be dealing with one challenge, this massive challenge of government control, you're going to have to have different expertise gotcha. and bringing things together from different perspectives and having an impact to chip away at the hole that they may have. Okay, you're right.